I'd like you to take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, for our scripture reading to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 for our scripture reading. We are going to read verses 16 through 24 of Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> and we'll read the verses responsibly. We begin together on verse 16, and then I'll read 17, and together on 18, and we'll alternate like that, till we end together on verse 24 of Luke chapter 14. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing please to read God's word. And we'll begin together on verse 16. Ready? Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse the first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled for I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper and let's pray together shall we father we ask you to add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here tonight we ask you Lord that you would continue to make our hearts ready to receive the word of God tonight that Lord we thank you for the music we've heard this evening thank you Lord for the message of the songs Thank you. It's ministered to us. It's helped us. I pray, Lord, that we have sung as unto you. And, Lord, we ask you now that you would help us to focus and to concentrate and that we would put our heart in tune with your heart, that we would hear what the Spirit would want to say to his church this evening. And so, Lord, bless us special to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. a voice calling me from an old rugged tree and it whispers draw closer to me leave this world far behind there are new heights to climb and a new place in me you will find for whatever to draw closer to you, Lord, that's what I'll be willing to do. Or whatever it takes to be more like you, that's what I'll be willing to do. Take my houses and my lands, change my dreams and my plans, for I'm placing my whole life in your hands. And if you call me someday to a land far away, Lord, I'll go and your will obey. For whatever it takes to draw 
closer to you, Lord. That's what I'll be willing to do. For whatever it takes to be more like you, that's what I'll be willing to do. I'll trade sunshine for rain, comfort for pain. That's what I'll be willing to do. For whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'll be Our Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, already for what we've heard this evening. It's already been good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And Lord, we're asking you now that you would speak to us through your word. I want to thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word and for allowing us to hold copies in our hands tonight. Lord, I pray that we would listen carefully to the truth you have for us this evening, that we would receive it. Lord, not as the words of men or as the words of a man, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. And Lord, I pray that Thy Spirit would speak to the people of God tonight. Lord, do what only You can do in every heart and life. And I pray that each of us would be listening careful, carefully to the still small voice of the Spirit of God as He speaks to us this evening. Lord, help me to say what I ought to say and not say what I ought not to say. Lord, I promise that I'll listen to you tonight if you'll help the folks through your word this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. If your Bible's open to Luke 14, I'd like to talk about this parable that Jesus gave about a great supper. And uh, he's let people know that a great supper was being planned, a party was being planned. Now you understand... Things were a little different in those days than what they are in our day. Uh, For example, even when a wedding was planned, the wedding would be announced, but the time would not be announced. Uh, We don't do it that way in our society, in the Western world. Uh, When you get a wedding invitation, there's a date on there. Or at the very least, sometimes, as much as a year in advance, they'll say, save the date. And uh, you know to leave that date set aside. It wasn't so much that way in the Middle East and uh, when they had a banquet or they had a wedding or they had a big feast like is being planned here, uh, folks would know it's coming. They would know that they're going to be invited to come and they will have committed to come. They just don't know when. In other words, they're saying, yes, I'll come. So whenever the invitation comes that it's ready to come, I'll drop what I'm doing. I'll, I'll stop whatever's going on and I come. When it was a wedding, people would stop what they're doing and fall in line with the wedding procession and go attend the wedding. And uh, this is what's happening here uh, in our parable. The, the great, a great supper is being prepared, a great meal. And, and then he sends the servant out to invite the people to have received the invitations to come. If you notice in verse 16, he made a great supper and bade many. And then he sent his servant at supper time. The RSVPs had already gone out. But he see because he's sending them out to them that were bidden, and now the message is come, for all things are now ready. Okay, and so now they're supposed to come, and and as he goes out, they begin to meet excuses about why people couldn't come, even though they had RSVP that they would come. They knew the banquet was being prepared. They knew that they were supposed to have cleared their schedule, but they begin to give excuses. Other things and other people had taken priority over attending the supper, over attending the banquet. And uh, you understand, the, the overall big picture of this is the one preparing the supper is God. And the banquet that He's prepared is salvation. And the extend, and, and listen, uh, many are invited to come. In fact, we know from the other scripture, all are invited to come. God so loved the 
world that He gave His only begotten Son. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, God who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so the message and the preparation, the invitation is to all. And we're to come and partake of what God has prepared for us. We don't have a part in salvation. We simply receive what God has done for us. That's why eternal life is a gift from God. The gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is not through what we do. It's through what Jesus Christ has already done. Uh, God says all things are ready. Jesus has paid the price. He He died. He was buried. He rose again. He ascends to heaven. He's able to save all those that come unto God by Him. And so just come, for all things are now ready. What do you have to do to be saved? Come to Jesus and accept Him as your Savior. He's paid it all. He's done it all. You just must trust Him. You must put your faith in Him. Now, they begin to make excuses. And these are excuses that people make for not coming to Christ. These are excuses that people make uh, not accepting God's invitation of salvation. And by the way, the devil's favorite excuse is not to say, no, the Bible's not true. The devil's favorite excuse is not to say, no, Jesus isn't the Savior. He's not the Son of God. No, I think the devil's favorite excuse is this. The Bible's true. Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, you need to be saved. You just don't need to be saved now. It wasn't that these people didn't want to come. They just didn't want to come now. There are, there are, I believe that, that hell will be full of people who fully intended to get saved. They just didn't want to do it now. The devil's favorite word when it comes to salvation is tomorrow. Tomorrow. God's word when it comes to salvation is always today. Today. Now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. It's always now. If you're talking about tomorrow, that's not God's word. Uh, today is God's Word. And so, we certainly, by the way, we certainly don't like it when people make excuses. If you've ever witnessed to people and tried to press upon them the urgency of receiving Christ as their Savior and, and they don't want to make the decision, they want to push it off, you try to probe a little bit and find out what is it that's, that's keeping you from receiving the gift of eternal life. Why would you not want this? Why would you not want to accept this gift? And we warn them, Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day can bring forth. Uh, we don't know. You know, there, there, there's uh, people in the Bible who put off salvation. Uh, Felix who said, I'll hear you at a more convenient time. Uh, that convenient time never came as far as we know. People who put off salvation in the Bible as far as we know, the cases that are mentioned, never did receive Christ as their Savior. And so we press upon them the need. We don't like to have excuses uh, why they won't come to Christ. But listen, the same excuses, and here's how I want, to, I want you to look at this passage this evening. The same excuses that we do not want to accept in the lost, in coming to Christ, we tend to tolerate and accept when it's the saved not wanting to serve Christ. Okay? We, we don't want to accept it in the lost person when they use the excuses as they why they won't come to Christ. And we'll, we'll certainly tell them, well, they made excuses. Or, well, they had some excuse why they couldn't come. Or they had some excuse. And by the way, an excuse years ago, I heard a message and a guy defined an excuse as a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. And I never forgot that. And, uh, and that's all an excuse is. And, and they make an excuse. And it's not, it, none of these are legitimate, by the way. Nobody, the first guy said, I bought, some, I bought a field and uh, I bought a field, a piece of ground and I have to go see it. Do you buy land without looking at it? Uh, if you do, I got some uh, oceanfront property to sell you in Arizona, all right? And uh, we'll, 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 do a, we'll do a deal. Uh, another guy said, well, I bought five yoke of oxen and I got to prove them. Are you really going to buy oxen you haven't proved? What if one's blind and what if one is lame and, you know, you, you, you're, you've been taken? You're, you're not going to do that. That's an excuse. Now, the third guy said, by the way, it's interesting, isn't it? Verse 18, when the guy said, I bought a piece of ground, I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I bought the oxen. Notice how he ended it. I pray thee have me excused. They both asked to be excused. But then the third guy said, I've married a wife and therefore I can't come. He didn't even ask to be excused. He just said, (laughs) apparently what you read in there is, she said, I'm not coming. 
All right, and uh, I don't know what kind of wife he married, but, uh, you know, the truth is, you, if you get married, what newlywed doesn't like to show off his bride? Uh, certainly everybody would. And uh, so that's not even a legitimate excuse. But, so none of them are legitimate, but neither are our excuses that we use not to serve God. All right, now let's look at these three excuses and we'll, we'll give some thoughts on them and then we'll wrap it up for this evening, all right? Number one, the first excuse is the fellow who said, I bought a piece of ground and I must need to go and see it. That's the excuse of wealth, wealth, materialism, if you will. And uh, the land purchase is a done deal. He's not, I'm not going to plow the field. I'm not going to sow some seed for a future harvest. I have to go and see it. Again, that was an excuse. If you've already purchased it, what, mattered, what does it matter if you see it now or not? It's yours. <laughs> you can do nothing about it. Uh, why would you not want to go ahead and accept the invitation that you already said you'd accept, and now you won't go? Maybe it involves some greed. Maybe it, it certainly involved pride. But, he, but, but the whole purpose is this. The physical things mattered more to him than the spiritual things. The things of this world meant more to him than the things of the next world. If I'm reminded, when I read that, I was reminded of the fella uh, that Jesus called the, the, the fool who, who was very successful in business, and he said, what should I do? Uh, I don't have enough room to bestow all my goods. Well, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down these barns and I'll be big, build bigger barns uh, so I can bestow all the fruits of my labor. And, and, and God said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then, who shall these things be? He's saying, you're living for all this, and you're living for your wealth, and you're living for your, for your uh, uh, pleasure of things, and the things of this world, but you're going to die. And you'll leave it all behind. The things of this earth are not worth living for. And boy, we have wealth in this country. You see, in the parable of the sower, in fact, you're in Luke 14. Would you just put your finger there and look back a couple chapters to Luke 8? Luke chapter 8, and look with me about the parable of the sower that had four different types of soil that the seed fell on. Would you look at verse 14 of Luke 8? Jesus explains the parable. Did you notice he talk, he's talking about the, the, the seed that fell among the thorns? And it says, That which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard, they go forth and are choked with the cares of and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. What chokes the Word of God? What chokes the ability for that person to bring forth fruit? He says it's the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. And my friend, you only have to travel outside the United States to know the cares and the riches and the pleasures that we have in our country that they don't have to deal with in other countries. We spent three weeks in the Philippines. And, and I understand, uh, you, you went into houses and, and there's, in, in many houses there's no kitchen sink. Out to the side there's a hose and they have big pots and they put the dishes in there and they run the hose and they have suds and water and they, they, that's how they wash their dishes. The, you, you use the, the bathroom and the bathroom is the toilet bowl. There's no lid. There's just a bowl. And there's nothing to flush. It's just a bowl sitting there. There's a big thing of water there with, a, with like a dipper. And once you use the restroom, you, that's how they live. That's how they live. That's, that, that's, their, that's, their, that, that's how they grow up. That's what they have. No stove in many kitchens. It's, it's, yet you know what they do? They serve God. And they're happy serving God. I hope you get a chance to go and go to the Facebook page and, and listen to some of the videos and, and the singing and the, the, the music in the churches. It's just been, it's just been wonderful. Listen, don't, don't get focused on the things of this world. Don't get focused on all the pleasures that we have in America and, and, and lose sight of the things that are really important. And that's the things of God. Don't live for now. Live for eternity. You got one week before a big day. One week before we hope hundreds from the community will come and we can give them a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner. 
But more importantly, we can come and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Will you take one week and say, at least for this next week, listen, the things of God will be first and foremost in my life. And I'll give myself to the things of God, not the things of the world. I want you to think about something. I read this this week, and you don't have to answer them. Just, just think. I think you'll get the point in a minute. Can you name the five wealthiest people in the world? For those of you sports people, can you name the last five Heisman Trophy winners? That's the, that's the one who gets voted the best college football player. Can you name the last five winners of the Miss America pageant? Can you name ten people who've won the Nobel or the Pulitzer Prize? Can you tell me the last half dozen Academy Award winners? Can you name the last, last ten years worth of World Series winners? Probably not. Even those of us who are sports fans. Even those of us who, are, who, who get into those kind of things. You can't, you can't do it. And the point, point is this. You don't remember the headliners of yesteryear. You don't remember those, uh, the, the, the achievements of some who were the best in their field. The applause dies. The awards tarnish. The achievements are forgotten. The accolades and the certificates are buried with their owner. They're gone. It doesn't matter. But can you do this? Can you, can you name any teachers that impacted your life as you went through school? Can you, can you name three friends who've helped you through a difficult time? Can you, can, you name, can you name three people that have taught you something in life worthwhile that you still remember and you live by? Can you think of a few people that have made you feel appreciated and special to them? Can you think of five people you enjoy spending time with? You see, these are people who make a difference in your life and they're not the ones that are most famous or have the most credentials or have the most, we most wealth or the most money, or the most awards. They're the ones who took time to care. And what impacts people's lives are when people take time to care. One thing that a day like this does, listen, what we're, what we're trying to, to get the message out is not only because God's commanded us to go, the servant in the story here is you and me. We're to go out to tell everybody, come, for all things are now ready. So we're trying to be obedient to God, but we're trying to let a community know we care. And we want to help you. And we want to be a blessing to you. And we're willing to set aside uh, our time. Willing to, to make time in our week to come invite you to come. What does it tell them if we do not go out and invite them? That we're so wrapped up in ourselves we don't have time to invite them to come. Wealth. Let's look at the second fellow who they came to. Verse 19. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go prove them. I pray thee have me excused. The second excuse is work. First was wealth. The second is work or business. Again, uh, same situation. The purchase is already done. If, the ox, if one of the oxen are blind or they're maimed in some way, it's too bad. It's a done deal now. It's like buying a car without seeing it. If you finally get the car and it doesn't run, uh, too bad, fellow. You paid it. You bought it. It's yours. <laughs> and you got a lemon. You got a lemon. Make lemonade, I guess. And uh, as best you can do. So, as it could have been oxen, of course, to plow the field. Oxen, maybe to pull a cart. Maybe for business purposes. We don't know. Uh, maybe take the family places. But you understand, uh, you, you can't, listen, it's a good thing to work. And God honors work. Work is, a, work is a good word. Work's not a dirty four-letter word. God made man to work. That's a good thing. But don't let work come before God. Don't let work take the place of God. God gives you the ability to work. God gives you the opportunity to work. But don't let work become a God to you. Someone said we're in great danger when we worship our work, work at our play, and play at our worship. That's true. What we hear so much today is I'm, I'm so busy. I'm really convinced, and I, and I know it's true, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And you know what I found out? I found out that I find time to do the things I really want to do. 
And the things that I really don't want to do, I find a way to make an excuse not to do them. And that's true if you'll be honest with yourself. And so we have to find a way uh, to, to, to not be so busy. And why are you so busy? And if we're too busy for God, and we're too busy to serve God, then we are probably entirely, too, we are entirely busier than God ever intended for us to be. We've got too many things going on that don't need to be going on. We have to quit saying, what do I want? And start saying, what does God want? We have to start thinking about, you know, it's time that God's people start thinking godly. Godliness. And somebody this week sent me a couple pictures on the cell phone and it was, you know, one was a, a werewolf and one was some other Dracula or something and and I just sent it back. I said, I'm not real impressed. Oh, it's this, it's this app on my phone. I thought it was cool. Some Halloween thing, I think. And I said, you know what? I said, first of all, and, and I might as well just throw this out there for you, okay? I'll, I'll say this and then I'll duck behind the pulpit in case you want to shoot bullets at me, all right? But God and Halloween have nothing in common whatsoever. Nothing. What are, what, are, what are we thinking? Trying to blend those two together. They have nothing in common at all. I said, what does God have to do with Halloween anyway? I said, you know what? It's time that you stop thinking cool and start thinking godly. Is this godly? Is this godly? Where in the Bible does it say, uh, you know, uh, whatsoever things are honest and pure and lovely and of good report and cool, think on these things. Does this say that anywhere? Am I missing something? We're, 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 we missed the boat. What, can, what, is, what does God want to do in my life? How does God want me to think about this? What does God want me to do? Work is important. But don't let work replace your obedience to God. If you're working so much that you don't have any time for God, I guess we can pray that God will take that job away so you have time to serve Him. Or maybe you'll manage it better so you'll put your priorities where you will seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So we have one who gave wealth as an excuse. We have one who gave work as an excuse. And then, of course, you know the third one, verse 20. His excuse was his wife. Was his wife. Relationships, family. Then again, as I mentioned earlier, he didn't even ask to be excused. He just said, I'm not coming. And the problem was his priorities. He was placing human relationships above the relationship and fellowship with the Master. Somebody, listen. Every wife in this room ought to, ought to be thankful and ought to desire that they'd be the second greatest love of their husband's life. That, their, that his first greatest love would be Jesus Christ. That he'd love the Lord his God with all his heart and all his soul and all his mind and all his strength. And then he can love his wife. But you have to love God first. And by the way, every husband ought to think that his wife, that, she, that he would be her, her second greatest love. That first she would love the Lord with all her heart and all her soul and all her mind and all her strength. I, I, I don't like it when I hear people, a husband, a wife, or anybody say, well, he's my rock or she's my rock. You know, when you look in the Bible, there's only one that's supposed to be our rock. And that's the Lord Jesus. God is my rock. Read the Psalms. It's over and over again. God is my rock. He's the one uh, we, we run to and He's the one we hide in. He's the one we anchor to. So we see that, you know, there's just not a lot of profit to these who offer up excuses. Don't use the blessing of your family. Don't use the blessing of a husband or a wife to rob you of the blessing of serving God. Don't, don't, don't use it that way. And let me, let me help you. If you ask enough people, and you, you tell enough people about your excuses, you're going to find enough people to agree with you and validate your excuse 
for you to do whatever you want to do. And so, be, be, what happened to the people who gave excuses? Would you look down at verse 24? The parable says, Jesus said, I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Wow. You know what happened? None of them got in. None of them were able to get in. Have you ignited the power of excuses in your life? I hope God would forgive us for making excuses not to serve Him. Forgive us for making excuses and report to our post of duty. You know, I got to thinking about this. We've, we've really had a change in Christianity. Brother Morrison, I don't know how long you've been preaching. How long you've been preaching? I had, a, I had a feeling you might have been a while. And you were saved before that. You grow up church and you're, you're similar. I mean, I have 35 years. And you know, it, we, we had an emphasis on that. In the, in the late 60s and in the 70s and even in the 80s, it was, it was I'm reporting for duty. Man, I'm in the Lord's army. To, uh, give me my orders. Give me my marching orders. I'm ready to go serve Jesus Christ. And, and we don't hear anything about that anymore. We don't hear about, listen, I, I, I'm here to report for duty. I'm saved to serve. I'm saved to whatever God tells me to do, I'm ready to do it. I've enlisted in the army of the Lord. And, and we've lost that. We, we need to report again to our post of duty. About time you, you start thinking you got excuses, let me, let me run through a few with you as we go through the Bible. Just, just listen carefully. Adam said to God, it was the woman you gave me. The woman said it was the serpent. It was the serpent that beguiled me. Cain killed his brother when God asked him about it. He said, am I my brother's keeper? Excuses. Abraham became an expert at telling lies. Half-truths, if you will, but a half a truth is a lie. And not trusting God. Lied about his wife. Sarah laughed in her tent when she was told she's going to have a baby. And of course, Isaac, the name of Isaac means laughter. And after time went by and she didn't have the baby, she took things in her own hands. It was her suggestion to Abraham that he take Hagar and have a son by her. And later on, of course, we know that Isaac and Ishmael had problems. And, and even Sarah despised Hagar and her son. Ishmael was a wild man, had trouble getting along with others. Isaac followed his dad's footsteps and told some half-lies about his wife. Jacob was known as a supplanter, the trickster. He cheated and lied to his own father. Cheated and lied to his father-in-law. He got cheated once and ended up with Leah and not Rachel on the wedding night. Remember that? Leah was tender-eyed. Okay? Uh, she, Leah wasn't real pretty to look at. All right? And uh, Jacob got a hold of her. And her husband didn't want her for a while. Joseph had a pretty dysfunctional family. His brothers hated his guts. Joseph, knowing that, still told him about his dreams and how they're all going to bow down to him one day. That wasn't real bright, I don't think. I think I'd have kept that to myself. Talk about sibling rivalry. Moses experienced the burning bush, but then began to doubt whether God would use him at all. Began to make his excuses. You read about that in Exodus chapter 4. He said he couldn't speak well, but when you go to the New Testament and listen to Stephen's sermon in Acts 7, he said Moses was eloquent in speech. So we know that was an excuse. In fact, when he went into Pharaoh, Aaron never got to say anything. Moses did all the talking. Even though he's the one who asked Aaron to come along. Aaron made the golden calf in Exodus 32 when Moses was a long time coming down. And when confronted about the golden calf, hey, the Bible says Aaron took it and fashioned it. You know what Aaron said? I just put all this gold in there and pfft, out came this calf. Imagine how funny that must have been. Can you imagine Moses looking at him saying, Really? Is that the best you can do? <laughs> what an excuse. Gideon was visited by the angel, and the angel said, Thou mighty man of valor. And huh, Gideon said, Are you talking to me? 
He said, I'm, I'm the, my family's the poorest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. I'm nobody. I'm from a worthless family. What do you mean I'm a mighty man of valor? I'm hiding from the Midianites now. I don't want them to find me. Rahab's middle name was The. Her last name was Harlot. Jeremy and, Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. Hannah had a dysfunctional family. Her husband's other wife and children made fun of her. When Hannah was praying, Eli the priest thought she was drunk. David didn't go to battle, had an affair, and ordered one of his best soldiers to die in the battle, murdered him. Elijah went through times of, of uh, uh, depression. And, and especially when Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. Jonah went in the wrong direction and got on the boat, ran away from God. Peter was a, Peter, Peter was a big mouth. Sometimes would run his mouth before his brain got in gear. None of us ever have that problem, I'm sure. Peter, Peter had the nerve to rebuke Jesus. And try to tell him it wasn't going to be that way. In the garden, he took his sword out and cut a guy's ear off. I don't, I don't think he was intending to cut his ear off. I think he was getting to, going to split his head open or cut his neck. But he's a fisherman. He's not a soldier. So he... He cursed and denied that he knew Christ. But Peter also preached Pentecost. And 3,000 came to know Christ as their Savior. Three of the disciples fell asleep three times in one prayer meeting. Martha is known as the worried housekeeper. Woman at the well was divorced several times and was living with a man when she met Jesus. Saul had carried papers to have Christians killed. He held the coat of, st- coat of those who stoned Stephen. Paul was rejected by the early Christians. He wanted to join the, the disciples at Jerusalem and they wouldn't have anything to do with them. It was Barnabas who said, Brother Saul, come on. See, every, what I'm saying is, every one of those men or women, though they had these excuses, they were still greatly used by God. They, they, they could have used any of those excuses to say, I can't do anything. God can't do anything with me. Yes, God can do something with you. Hey, these people in the Bible were no different than you and I. They're, they're people of like passions, just like we are. Don't look at people in the Bible and say, yeah, God did it with them, but man, He ain't doing anything with me. Oh, yes, He can. God uses nobodies. God uses nobodies and makes them somebodies in His eyes. <coughs> so we're to go out quickly into the highways and hedges. And the Bible says there in Luke 14, compel them to come in. The word compel is a very strong word. And literally, what it means is, you don't take no for an answer. You're compelling them. You have to come. You have to be my guest. Man, clear the schedule. How can I help you clear the schedule? i got to have somebody with me next Sunday. you got to be there. Well, I'll think about it. No, you got to think about it now. This is important. You see, if it's important to you, it'll become important to them. That's important to understand. You know what he said? Look at verse four, chapter 14 again of Luke 14, would you? Look at verse 23. The Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways, <coughs> excuse me, the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in. Why? That my house may be what, church? Yeah, filled. My house may be what? What kind of house does God like? Uh, Likes a full house. And He's not playing poker. Yeah? Yeah, God likes His house filled. What what, What does God tell us to do this week? Go out in the highways and the hedges, compel them to come in. Why? Because on November 12th, He wants His house to be He wants it to be filled. Now that doesn't happen if we don't go out. And go out how? Quickly. Go out quickly. Go out and have a purpose. Go out as quickly as you can and compel folks to come in. 
If we don't do that part, the house won't be filled. And God wants His house to be filled. You ask yourself this question. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? And, in, and if not here, then where? Ask yourself that question. You know, when Queen Elizabeth II was crowned, she sent an invitation to those of her subjects chosen to be present for the occasion. The invitation was sent out to those in her realm, to members of the government, to the representatives of the common people. But every invitation that went out had the same closing statement. At the end of every invitation, the closing statement was this, all excuses ceasing. You're invited to the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, and at the end of the invitation it said, all excuses ceasing. I would ask you tonight, church, as we head into the last week for our dinner day, we have 9,000 flyers to get out, 9,000 invitations. Can we go out quickly into the highways and the hedges of Grove City and Urban Crest and Columbus, the southwest side, through the hilltop? Can we go out and compel them to come in that His house may be filled? All excuses ceasing. May God help us to have no excuses. Let's do what God's asked us to do. Amen? Let's pray, shall we? Father, I pray you'll take the truth now this evening. Lord, we, we desire to do what you want us to do. Lord, you have, you have commanded that we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You gave an example here of a great supper. We're kind of trying to model that by having a, a great dinner next Sunday. We're inviting people to come free. No charge. Everything is ready. They just need to come. And Lord, I'm praying that you'll help us to do what we ought to do. And Lord, I pray that it just as we don't want to run into excuses from people as to why they won't come, I pray that we're not offering up excuses as to why we won't go and invite people to come. And so, Father, I pray that tonight each of us would look at our heart and say, God, what would you have me to do? What can I do in these next six days to see that your house is filled on November 12th? And I simply pray, God, that you would speak to the hearts of your people tonight. And that, Lord, we would do it out of a love for you and a desire to be obedient to what you've asked us to do. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. We'll have our invitation tonight. wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart this evening. I've, I've been one of those who has, I, I seem to always have an excuse as to why I can't do what, what I'm going to do. But maybe tonight the Lord has huh, kind of broke through those excuses and said, why don't you just, maybe the Lord would tell you, why don't you just take 50 every day and get 50 out every day this week. That would be 300 for the week for you. 50 every day. I don't know what it is the Lord has laid on your heart, but He's spoken to you tonight. And you'll either say, yes, Lord, or you'll begin to make excuses. Don't make excuses. Just say, yes, Lord. I'll do what you want me to do. I want, I want what you want, Lord. I want your house to be filled. I want folks to respond to the invitation. I want folks to receive Christ as their Savior. And I wonder how many folks tonight would just say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart tonight. And I will do what God tells me to do. No more excuses. Pastor, pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me tonight. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. God bless you. That's great. You may put them down. I looked on the list of those passing out flyers. There's 27 different family units or names on there. 
but we have uh, almost double that number in our directory. That means about half the people have passed out flyers. Surely everybody could pass out flyers. You can take them with you. Hand them out to people where you go, as you're going. Give them away. Just ask the Lord what, what you could do. If not us, who? If not here, where? If not now, when? Let's serve God. Let's ask the Lord to bless our effort. Let's ask the Lord to use us. Let's ask God to bless next Sunday in a great way. That many will hear the gospel. Many will receive Christ as their Savior. Many can be fed. Not only physically, but spiritually as well. Heavenly Father, I thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful gospel that we have to share with the world, to share with our community. And I pray, Lord, you'd use us to go out in the highways and hedges this week and to go out quickly and compel folks to come in. Lord, help us to spread the seed all over the city, inviting folks to come. And Lord, I pray you'd bless the effort and the labor of your people. Hear our prayer tonight as we bow our knee to you and ask your blessing upon next Sunday. Lord, we'll work and we'll labor, but we trust you to give the increase. And so, Lord, hear our prayer tonight and forgive us for so many times offering excuses. Help us to make the effort to compel them to come in. Have your way in each heart and life now in this invitation, I pray, and I thank you for it. With your heads bowed, would you stand to your feet? As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. The altar is open. Come pray tonight. Oh, Ask God's to blessing Jesus on next Sunday, will you? I surrender. That's right. Oh, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, oh, to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, oh, to Jesus, I surrender all. At his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all. Oh, to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, true, Thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, oh, to Thee my blessing. Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all, oh, to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Look this way for a minute, if you would, please. We're glad to have uh, Tanya Hoskins coming tonight. Tanya was saved and baptized at Bible Baptist Church uh, years ago under Pastor Joe Rock. And uh, Tanya's coming back tonight to rededicate her life to Christ. And uh, Kay Wallace talked to her this morning, and uh, she wants to make that public, that she's dedicate, rededicating her life to the Lord. And Tanya, praise the Lord. And I uh, hope you'll be, you be faithful now, all right? One of the best things you can do is just set it down that you'll be faithful. 
Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. I know you want to come Friday night for the RU program and be involved in that discipleship program. That would be wonderful. And uh, you just, just set it down. Sunrise East, sets in the West, two plus two is four. Water runs downhill. You'll be here and when the doors are open, all right? It'll help you. It'll help you. And it'll change your life, all right? Praise the Lord. And uh, that's wonderful. I know Mama's prayed for you for years. And uh, she's delighted you're here, I'm sure. Amen. That's great. And uh, some of you, the Talladays and uh, Poll Label, I got a phone call. Poll Labels aren't here, are they? Got a phone call from Warren Storm. He's down in Lancaster. Or Lancaster. Or they, they don't say, they say that differently than they do in Pennsylvania. But he was visiting for their bus route. And he met people that rode the bus to Bible Baptist in 86 through 89. And uh, they're living down there now. And he signed, they gave good testimony of being saved and baptized and knew the Lord. And uh, he signed their children up to ride the bus down there uh, to the church. So uh, he, he just thought he'd call and share that information for those bus workers from back then that uh, they have some fruit that remains. And uh, people knew they were saved and uh, gave a good testimony about it. So that was a blessing. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Amen. And uh, well, it's been good to be in church. Now, <clears throat> flyers are in the room downstairs, the conference room right across from the nursery. Uh, sign them out, will you? Just put your name down there. Take flyers. If you're going to do 100 a day, then, then take 300, do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then come back Wednesday night and reload, okay? And uh, then take Thursday, Friday, Saturday, okay? Uh, but, but take whatever God has put on your heart to do. And, uh, but if all of us do something, it'll get done. Amen? It'll get done. And uh, we'll trust God for that. All right, let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for a wonderful day today. Lord, thank you for our church family. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and the privilege we have to give the gospel uh, to our Jerusalem here in Grove City. And Lord, I'm praying that your hand of blessing will be upon your people this week and that, Lord, you'll bless the labor and the effort that goes into this big day and that, Lord, you'll touch the hearts of people to come and to be in our service next week. And, Lord, we're asking you that we'd see many come to know Christ as their Savior uh, because of us giving them a turkey dinner. And so, Lord, uh, undertake for us and do what only you can do. We trust you for that. We love you. We thank you for a wonderful Lord's Day today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thunderstorm in November. What about that, huh? We'll let you get going. Let's sing. Let's sing our closing song. We were going to do. I'm going to stick with this, Bob. Let's do. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it tonight, and then get your flyers right after service. All right. Got it. Let me hear you sing it. Ready? Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. To follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>